1 Thessalonians 4, 1 through 8. And Paul writes, Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the, in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what command, commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not, do not know God, but I mean, that, that no one should take advantage of you, of, of and defraud his brother, rather, in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but to holiness. There, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. And I want to echo the first verse in your hearing one more time. Finally, brethren, we urge and exhort in the, in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. Abound more and more. I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, what's the state of your union? What's the state of your union? We enter this month of January, our president will be giving his final State of the Union address. And during that time, he'll reflect on the uh, state of our union. He'll declare where we are as a nation what his plans are as president. He'll reveal reality, of course, from his perspective, but such is the job of every president. To give this speech, to give this communication, if you will, of how are we faring, how are we doing, how are we prospering as a nation. And I encourage all of us, tune in hear what he has to say. It is our duty to be aware of what's happening around us. It is our duty and job as Christians to be aware of the political system and what the issues are on the table and how we can pray and even serve as we effect change in our nation and in our country. We live in the greatest country in the world. I really still believe that. God still has his presence here in a large way, the remnant of the body of Christ that exists here, that is still doing the will of God. And you and I are part of that. And we should cherish and enjoy the freedom that we have as believers. But it's important as the president's addresses to the nation, as we reflect on just what's going on in our land, let's shift from our nation and the political scene and let's, let's ask that same question of ourselves. As the president is to the nation, we are to our souls. God has called us to take ownership for our own lives, for our own spiritual welfare, for our own spiritual development. It is our personal responsibility under heaven to make sure that we are in alignment with God's word. And as the president would begin the new year with the national address, you and I should begin the new year with a personal address. As the president is responsible to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America, his job, as powerful as it is, is not to do whatever he wants to do but to stay within the guidelines of the laws of the land and to provide the good for the, uh, to provide good and welfare for those that are under his care as citizens of this great nation. And thusly, you and I are responsible, not necessarily to the Constitution at this level, but there's a greater document. It's the Word of God. It's the Bible. And you and I, as the president is to the Constitution, you and I are to hold ourselves accountable and even one another. 
under God's holy word, under God's standard, under the truth of Jesus Christ. So uh, with that being stated, let's look at the state of our union. What is the state of your union? How are you doing this morning as we begin this brand new year? How are you faring this morning as we begin this brand new year? How are you growing? How are you uh, being used? How are you uh, maturing? How are you upholding the standard of God, the righteous standard of God in your life? And Paul is going to walk us through this this morning. I want you to pay close attention to how he brings this thing to the surface for you and for me. Paul begins, as it would be this personal say of the union, examination or speech or communication. And he begins by saying, finally, brethren. And as he begins that, that first word, we go back to chapter 3. And the closing verse of chapter 3 is, is the last three verses of that chapter, 11, 12, and 13. He prays for the church. Notice his prayer in chapter 3. Verse 11 says, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and all to all and, 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 and to all just as we do to you. So that he may establish you. Here it is. That he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Paul prays that the Lord might have your heart and that if the Lord has your heart, you're going to be sanctified. He prays for their sanctification, that they be holy before God, realizing that the Lord is coming again. And, 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 as, and, and as old as this text is, but look how relevant it still is. Because Paul prays not for their money. He doesn't pray for their happiness. He doesn't pray for their houses. He doesn't pray for their jobs. He doesn't pray for other opportunities. He prays for their sanctification. What a prayer. What a prayer. What a priority in prayer. Paul, as the one who is the father of this church, if you will, he comes and he prays for their holiness. He says, finally, because he's already, already covered them in prayer. And beloved, I echo the words of Paul this morning. As we begin 2016, I want you to understand, just like Paul covered the church uh, of Thessalonians, I want you to understand that, listen, Baraka, you are covered in prayer. My prayer for you is that you and I would be a holy people. My, 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 my desire is that we would be a sanctified people. Sanctified means to be set apart for God's holy purposes. My prayer is that we would be God's people in a new year. Not just normal people in a new year, but God's people. People that he can use. Who are the people that God uses? Those that have been set upon. He says, finally, brother, we urge you. <coughs> That's the second term. Urge. He urges them. He says, by, in the, in the Lord Jesus. He, he puts that on. He says, I urge you. Basically, not by my own words. It's not because of what I think. But I'm urging you based upon the authority of Jesus Christ. I come to you not because I'm a busybody. I come to you not because I want to meddle. I come to you because God has authorized me to ensure your welfare. To make sure that you understand your purpose. He's talking to the church. Let him speak to this church today. Because 2016 will not be an abracadabra good year. It's not magic. It's not osmosis. It's not because we will it to be. It's because we put certain things in place in our lives that God simply blesses. And whenever God puts his hand of blessing on your life, it doesn't matter when it is, you're going to live a blessed life. There's no other way to be blessed 
than to have God's hand of approval on your personal life, on your family, on your marriage, on your children, on your job, wherever you might be. You and I need to seek God's favor, God's blessing on this new year. Paul urges them in the authority of Jesus Christ. Because <coughs> in chapter 1, in chapter 1, verse 9, if you flip back there, chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul is talking of them, and he says, listen, for, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how we turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Paul declares in verse 9 of chapter 1, he opens up this letter by, 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 by saying, listen, you guys were once idol worshipers, but now you have turned, and now you are followers of the true God. And so he's urging them, he's not scolding them, he's not fussing at them, but he's urging them to continue. The nature of this letter is simply a letter of encouragement. He's not writing like the Corinthians where he has to uh, correct a, a lot of issues. He's not writing uh, to, to condemn and, and to uncover sin and hidden things within the church. He's writing to encourage them to continue. And point number one for our takeaway is this. Keep doing the right stuff. Keep doing the right stuff. You and I today have been built up in the faith in 2015. You and I have been encouraged by the word of God, by the preaching, by the teaching, even by the worship and the exposure we've had as a congregation. And that's soul food. And my admonishment to you this morning as we begin this state of our union reflection is to continue Doing the right stuff. That's as simple as I can put it. Continue to do the right stuff. Now let me tell you something. If you're not doing the right stuff, I'm not talking to you right now. I'm here to encourage those that are doing what thus saith the Lord. Keep doing the right things. Why? Because as you remain consistent and committed to the righteous path that God has ordained for your life, that is the place and how God will ultimately bless your life. And as Paul echoes these words to the church, so does that echo come to 2016. Baraka will be blessed and used of God in extraordinary ways only as we continue in the faith. Only as we continue to honor God. Let me encourage you during a good time. Not conflict. Not a battle. Not a war. You're not mad. You're not angry. A good time. Let me encourage you in a good spot in life. Keep on doing the right thing. Nobody's angry. Nobody's on church discipline. Nobody's being put out. No. Let me encourage you during a good time. Keep on doing the right thing. Would you help me communicate that? Turn to your neighbor and tell them, neighbor, neighbor. Keep, on keep, on. keep on keeping on. Keep on doing the right stuff. Right because stuff. that is how we will make it through 2016. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the reverse of that, let me tell you this. If we're not doing the right things, this is an admonishment to all of us to get on the righteous path that God has for our lives so that we can become what God wants us to become. Yes. It's important that we understand. Paul makes it clear, you guys were idol worshipers, but you turn. That means to repent, to have a change of heart and a change of mind, and practically, not in theory, but they actually made a lifestyle change, and they turned from idols, and they now serve the true and the living God. You and I are here today because we have that same change in our lives. Chapter 2 and verse 13 says this, 2 and verse 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the words of men, but, it, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectually works in you who believe. He says, listen, you guys turned from idols to the truth, and now you have a hunger and a desire for the word of God. 
The only thing that will keep you in 2016 is that you and I develop a healthy appetite above anything else in this world for the word of God. I, I pray that December 2016, we'll be able to stand and hear testimonies. Pastor, I have grown in the word of God. I have grown in my love for God's word. I can't wait to get more and more and more and more. Because in, 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 in chapter 4, he says, listen, he says, listen, that you should abound more and more. Paul says, listen, you guys are on the right track. Keep it up. Hype it up. Turn it up. Let's get, let's, let's get in more. Why? Because we're going to need all we can get. The reason why this is so important is because this is how we honor God. How are you doing in your union with Christ? How are you doing in your commitment with Christ? Are you doing the right stuff? Keep on doing the right stuff. Abound more and more. It means to keep with a direct commitment to God. To be full, to abound, to be full. Paul says to keep doing the right things. Follow the example you've learned of us. I like how Paul can say that. <coughs> he was directly connected to their sanctification. He was directly connected to their growth. He was directly connected to their spiritual well-being. And he says, listen, I'm not, I'm not just dishing information at you. I'm not just throwing truth at you. But I'm here to walk with you until it becomes a reality in your life. And I'm committed to your sanctification. Beloved, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought to be committed to one another's sanctification. You and I ought to be also concerned, not just about ourselves, but we ought to be concerned about one another. If your brother stumbles, it ought to bother you. If your sister falls, it ought to bother you. And not to ridicule, not to stomp them, not to run them in the dirt, but to come alongside and to help them to be set apart for God's glory. That's the way we grow as a church. And I'm not so much asking, Lord, fill the church and pack with people. I don't want a bunch of folk. Oh, but I want a handful of disciples. Don't have to have every seat filled right now because we got some work to do with the folk we got here. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Come on, come on, come on. We got work to do. The job is laid out. It's clear. God is concerned about your sanctification and my sanctification. Who cares about a warehouse full of folk up in a church having a religious experience when they walk out and have no commitment to the sanctifying work of God in their lives? They wasted their time. They could have gone to the mall or to the movies. They could have gone and played golf. They could have washed the car at home. But why come to God's house? And to still resist the sanctifying work of God. It's a waste of time. The purpose of our attendance and our involvement is that God might have all of us solely set apart for his glory and abound more and more. Hmm. Notice how he as Paul reflects on this, he says, as we taught you how to, you saw it from us. That reminds me of Matthew 28, 20. You know the Great Commission, and Paul echoes that. He says, the Great Commission is, verse 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded, I have commanded you. Teaching them. What is teaching? Let me just walk here for a moment because I want us to all leave with a clear understanding of what God says here. He says in the Great Commission, teaching them to observe all things. How do you and I make disciples of other people? <coughs> we teach them to obey what God has already said. Point blank and simple. Teach them to be obedient to what God's word says. That's how we begin to make disciples. 
That is the Great Commission. And that's what Paul is doing here with this church. He is modeling before them how to be a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, a man of God, someone that God can use. Paul in the elsewhere says, follow me as I follow Christ. Be imitators. And I'm glad Paul could say that with a clear conscience. Follow me as I follow Christ. Let me tell you something. You and I need to be sanctified, set apart, so that we can declare that same thing to our weaker brother or our weaker sister so that they can have a visual uh, uh, example of someone who's becoming. Amen. We're not talking about perfection, but we're talking about someone who's being perfected. And if, we're, if we don't have something in our eye, something in our mentality, something in our heart that we can latch on to and say, they're on the mark. They're not perfect. I see the flaws. But they're going somewhere I want to go. And I wonder this morning, is there anyone in the room that wants to stop being religious and go where God is? Is there anybody in the room that, don't fool me, do you really want to begin the process of becoming like Jesus? That was Paul's motive in, in establishing the church. That the gospel, that the, the Bible, that God's word would be honored through the lives of the saints. Yes. Amen. Without that, we do a discredit to the gospel. Right. We cancel out what the word says. Right. Because we're actually doing the opposite of what it says. As we check the state of our union, keep doing the right stuff. And abound more and more. Personally, but some of us need to be like a Paul and help others to abound more and more because of our example. Let me encourage you this new year as we keep doing the right things. Know that you are covered in prayer daily as a church. Know that you've been changed by the truth of God's word. That's where we honor God's word here every Sunday. Know that you 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 that your consistency in God's truth is necessary for your success this year. That's where the abounding comes in. Don't lose that. If you if you on this first section, I want you to really grasp that. Abound, 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 abound. Don't go back. Don't go back. Don't pull back. Don't 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 press back. Don't don't fall back. Don't be pulled back. Abound. Get 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 what you get this morning. But when you get home. Go on and get some more. Amen. Pray while you're here. Worship while you're here. But when you get home, you don't have to stop. Amen. Come on, talk to me, somebody. Abound. Abound. The neighbors ought to know you love Jesus. Your family ought to know you love the Lord. Your coworkers ought to know there's something strange about you because you're abounding. Little dad won't do me on Sunday morning. A little drop here and driplet there won't keep me when the heat is turned up. I need to be abounding. Abounding in the word of God. Abounding in prayer. Abounding in faith. Grow. Becoming. Declaring. Showing the world. Like Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I know something. It is the power of a living God who will save both the Jew and the Gentile alike. I'm convinced. And I'm in this thing for the long haul. Is there anybody in here this morning uh, that has decided uh, you didn't just step at the edge? Uh, doing the right stuff. Because like Jesus, as we said in the Sunday school hour, like Jesus defeated Satan when he came to tempt him. He used the word of God. And we spent our time in Sunday school memorizing God's word. Because the more you know of God's truth, it is a sword that defeats the enemy every time. You need to stop trying to fight the devil with no word, with a dull sword, with a tooth. You need to get your sword and know your word so that you can experience victory. Amen. Defeated saints are those that don't know the word. But 
I declare if you get God's word in your life oh, yeah. daily, oh, yeah. you'll find power right. and in those same pressure points, in those same tender spots, in those same problematic situations, God will give you the supernatural ability in a new year. And I'm not trying to fill your mind and, and, your, and your ears with a bunch of fixed dishes stuff and fake stuff that doesn't really work. I'm telling you what will work. It'll work in January. It'll be the same in March. It'll be the same in August. Come around November, you'll be having the same victory. Why? Because the word will work whenever you decide to work it. Some of us keep doing the right stuff. Some of us start doing the right stuff. But secondly, he goes on here. Not only keep doing the right stuff, but secondly, keep God's will first in your life. Notice what the Bible says here. Verse 3. He says, for this is the will of God. This is the will of God. You know, a lot of people are asking in so many different ways, what is God's will for this new year? What is God's will for my life in this season? This is the will. Look at your Bible. Let God tell you. This is the will of God. What are the next two words? Read your Bible. What are the next two words? Say it loud. Your sanctification. What is God's will for us in 2016? Not that you become rich. Not that you get a promotion. Not that you become some superstar. Not anything earthly or temporary. God's will for each and every one of us is our personal sanctification. Are you understanding what the word says? I'm not making this up. It's right in your Bible. Your sanctification. He says, listen, God's will for us in this new year is our personal holiness. Not our happiness. Not our appetites. Not our careers. Not our money. God wants us to be holy because he is what? Holy. This year, stop making excuses for your sins and the problems in your life and the issues in your life. Be Listen, as we reflect on the state of our union, we have to be honest with where we are. And if we are still dabbling in sin and in the flesh, then listen, beloved, we've got to come to grips with that and repent and turn so that God can make us holy. There's no prerequisite. There's no other way. Change and transformation don't come with the new year. But they rather come with a new heart. Just because it's a new year doesn't mean everything's going to be all right. I'm not going to lie to you. Everything changes when your heart changes. Y'all kind of quiet on me this morning. I know you wanted to shout me down sermon and good, you know, just, oh, just new year, new year, new year. Let me talk about the real stuff that we drag from year to year that ruins the new year. We don't like to look at it. We don't like to talk about it, but it's called the opposite of sanctification. The flesh, the world, the devil, the things that are carnal in nature that we, we have let become a part of our lifestyles that we drag from the old year into the new year, and we become the same person and even worse in a brand new opportunity when it doesn't have to be that way. Change and transformation come from a new heart. Someone who's been set apart and is really serious about their commitment to God. There's some other aspects of salvation I want to run, run through very briefly. You can jot down these verses. The first act, act, aspect of salvation, or sanctification rather, is salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4 says, listen to what God says. Who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Number one, it is God's will that you and I be saved. Yeah. Secondly, self-sacrifice. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Very familiar passage. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. What? Holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. Self-sacrifice. That's God's will. Well, thirdly, being spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.18. It says, and be not drunk with wine... Wherein is excess, but be filled with the what? With the spirit. What is God's will? That we be spirit filled. 
controlled by the Spirit of God. Well, fourthly, being submissive. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 13 and 15 through 15. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or as, 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 uh, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. By a submissive lifestyle as believers in a sin-cursed world, we still show forth the praises of God by our lives of submission. It is God's will. Fifthly, by being willing to suffer. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. For it is better if the will of, if the will of God be so that you suffer for doing well than for evil doing. It is God's will that you and I even endure suffering, hard times. And if such will be the case before this year is out. But are we willing to be like Christ? And then there, uh, sixthly, uh, being satisfied. First Thessalonians 5, 18. It says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Right straight from the word of God. It is God's will. It is God. What is God's will? That I align myself with his word and allow his spirit to sanctify my life. If you are resisting the sanctifying work of the spirit this year, you're out of the will of God. You're kicking against the very power that can Bless your life. Amen. And that wants to bless yes. your life. Yes. But as we submit to the spirit of God and to the word of God, we find that he has first place and his will can become accomplished in our lives. Amen. Well, thirdly and finally, keep your temple clean. He says sanctification in verse 3. But he says something in the latter part of that verse that you should abstain from sexual Immorality. Now, why does Paul go here if there are no issues? He's encouraging. He's not fussing. He's not condemning. He's encouraging. Why does he encourage them in this way? And why does he turn the conversation towards a personal matter? He says, listen, beloved, uh, God's will is you be sanctified, you be holy. But then he says, listen, that you keep your temple clean. He says that you abstain from sexual immorality. The word abstain means to refuse, to refrain, to decline. And, 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 and again, I echo the words of Paul because during a time of peace, during a time of ease, is the best time to make that determination. I'm going to be real with you. It's not the time during a, a moment of hot lust and passion to decide to do what's right. Come on, talk to me, somebody. That's not the time to get right with God. That time to make a commitment to the Lord when you're feeling it. Now, it, the time is when you can think clearly, when you can sense God's presence, and when you can have proper judgment and respond appropriately to what God says. Sober-minded. That's why Paul encourages the saints to be sober-minded because there's some stuff that God wants to say to you while you're sober so that when you get in the fire, you've already got what you need to make it through. I'm, I'm, I'm staying here for a minute because this is where many of us fall by the time February gets here. Many of us give up by the time August and June come around. Why? Because we didn't listen when it was time. When we had an opportunity. We had too many other things to do besides prepare ourselves. Like the winter time comes and the snow starts falling and you run out to the store to get some salt for your driveway. And you get to the store and it's all gone. Too late. Matter of fact, if you want to start stocking up on it now, go on, do it. Good time. It's kind of mild. No snow yet. But when it comes, you'll be ready. 
That's what Paul is trying to get you and I to understand. Now is the time to talk about these things, to think through these things, and to make a commitment before God that we're going to abstain. Abstain means to refuse, to refrain, to decline. Beloved, the devil has been trying to pass uh, 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 some laws and legislation in our lives. We're looking at the state of our union. The devil's trying to pass some things and get us tangled up in some things that are not God's will. But you and I need to stand up as believers and to veto every lie of the enemy, every tactic of the enemy. We need to abstain. Sorry, Satan. I decline. This will not pass my desk. Because I have a say-so in what I do with my life. I belong to Jesus. I'm not my own anymore. You can't just trick me like you used to trick me. You can, I'm not easily duped like I was before. I've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of me. And guess what? The power of God is enough to help you to stay. To say no to the devil. Some of us need to know how to say that without feeling bad about ourselves. No! No more discussion. No! No more. I'm not going to contemplate it. No! It's a done deal. Don't even try. Talk to the hand. Matter of fact, as we lift our hands in worship, I really believe we're giving the devil a hand at the same time. Lord, I love you. And the devil, <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, no. I'm going to do it God's way. Is anybody determined in 2016? You are, you're going to do it God's way. Paul said abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality very quickly is giving your body to another illegally. Let me tell you something very plainly. Two things. Your body belongs to two people. The Lord Jesus, and if you're married, your spouse. Anything outside of that is illegal. And Paul says we need to think about these things now because the enemy will come with all kinds of tricks to try to get you to compromise God's holy standard in your life. And listen, you and I need to be real in the times when we can think soberly and make that commitment before God. And let's get real. Come on. Fornication, adultery, masturbation. I'm going to get real for a minute. Uh, pornography, uh, sexting. You know that texting? Sexting, dirty conversations, and the like are not God's will for your life. I know I just threw a curveball. You didn't expect the preacher to say all that on Sunday morning. But let me tell you something. That's sexual immorality. I'm sorry. I don't have a G-rated version for what God says is sin. If you need to abstain from it, you need to know what it is. Because some of us compromise because we think it's okay or we can handle it. Stop lying to yourself. You cannot handle what is illegal. It will ruin you. I thought I'd get more amens on that one right there. And let me tell you, what's good for the people is good for the preacher too. Because this is the whole word of God. Sexual immorality. He says, abstain from it, refuse it, decline it. But rather, he says, look on uh, 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 verse 4, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. He says, listen, beloved, and he says to the vessel, I'm not fussing at you. I'm just, I'm walking you through what you need to be prepared for. Possess your vessel. Keep your vessel. In other words, have sexual self-control. Sexual self-control. You know, one of the things that ruins the church and members of the church, whether it be clergy, whether it be musicians, whether it be uh, singers, whether it be teachers, whoever it is. Listen, all regular, just all, uh, uh, lay people in the church. You know what ruins us more than anything else is that we don't have self-control. And the enemy knows that it can get us to fall into the temptation of what we desire, the flesh, what the flesh wants. That we create an appetite for that. And for many of us, we kept it on the wrap for so long. We said the right things in public, but we've kept this on the wrap for so long. And it's like stored away. It, we ignore it sometimes. We wish it away. But sometimes we want to pull it out. Y'all 
probably going to speak to me this morning, but I'm, I'm telling you where people live today. And, and this is what happens. And he says, listen, you and I need to make a, a decision that we're going to not have this under courage, but we're going to possess our vessels in honor and sanctification. Every part of us belongs to God. Every part of my mind belongs to God. Every part of my tongue belongs to God. My heart and the passions and desires of my heart belong to God. I am not playing with my life. I belong to Jesus and all to Jesus. I surrender. Nothing worse than somebody going in the new year undercover. Faking the funk. I got, to, I got to give it like it is. <laughs> Act in the part. And I'll be honest with you, there was a time in my life where I acted the part. I knew how to say the right stuff. I knew how to respond the right way. But I knew in my heart of heart I wasn't right with God. God had to use some people in my life to pull me aside to get me where I needed to be. And let me tell you something, that's the only way he continues to have his sanctifying work in your life. I look on the outward appearance. I don't know where you are. I don't know what's going on in your real life. I see your church life. And you see my church life. It would behoove all of us to ask ourselves what's the state of my union. How am I really doing in these areas? that God calls important? Have I shored up my own life so that when the winds blow and the, and the, and the, and, and the rain falls and the storm comes and, 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 and the tornadoes blow and all kinds of disaster and the enemy does what the enemy does, that I'm anchored. And that's not something that he does, but I've allowed him to possess me and hold me and keep me even when I don't. Some of us don't want to be kept. We love God to a certain degree, but we don't want God to completely set us apart. We don't want God to completely sanctify us wholly because there's some pleasures of sin that we still enjoy. We believe somehow in some false sense that we can, we can mix the two. I can still do what I do and what I enjoy, but I can still serve God at the same time. And I'm going to tell you, oil and water will never mix. You and I have to be completely his. Completely his. Completely his. Oh. All to Jesus. Amen. Talked about it on Thursday, not bringing a backup plan in the 2016. Don't bring no baggage. Because this altar is open. And in a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come bring all your luggage. Don't care how much it is, how big it is, how heavy it is. His arms are big enough to carry and handle all of your mess. And to give you, in turn, listen, liberating, sanctifying, power-filled, spirit-filled life that will honor him and will be blessed in, in response. You and I have to make a decision today. We're going to possess our vessels, live our lives, and keep our temple clean. Paul makes this clear as I close. Because those that don't prioritize this or take it seriously are open game for the devil. Satan, listen, he can't read your mind. He can't tell the future, but he sees your response. Y'all hear what I'm saying? How you respond is what he takes note of. 
He's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything like God does. God sees your heart. The devil sees your actions. And he formulates his, his, his activity and his uh, plan of, of attack in your life based upon our habits and our routines and what we do when we leave this place having heard this word will show him how serious we are. But if you make a commitment to God while you're in this sanctified place, I'm here to tell you, I don't care what it is that you're looking at and what God has brought to your mind right now. Just be honest with God about it. Be honest with the Father right now. And if you'll simply be big enough to humble yourself and say, Lord, help me where I am. The state of my union is not where it needs to be. I've declined over the past year. Or maybe I'm stuck. Maybe I've become stagnant and stale. Maybe, maybe I, I have made wrong decisions and I, I've justified them and I've, I've gone off course and I, I'm not where I need to be. Be honest with yourself. When I preach, I'm not preaching just to communicate information. I preach for change. The message majority of the time is going to be something that we'll have to make a decision about. Because if we don't make a personal, if we don't buy into it, it will never become a part of us. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. Let me ask you this question. What's the state of your union? How do you fare this morning? Is your soul in health? Or are you bruised and bleeding, injured, maybe self-inflicted because of foolish choices? Is pride still reigning on the throne of your heart? Or really have you developed a sensitivity to the voice of God? Paul was admonishing them. Keep having that tender heart towards God. Keep making room for him, the will of God in your life. And the result of that is that you and I will find our vessels, our temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God wants a clean house. Who wants a clean house? God wants a clean house. He wants to sanctify you on this first Sunday, 2016. And he wants to keep on sanctifying you every day of your life. Why not let him begin right now? Why not give him the free reign in your life? And all you got to do is ask him. Ask him. Lord, help me. Maybe you'd have been saved. Today is a day of salvation. You can be saved and born again right now. Maybe you need to rededicate your life to the Lord. And as you reflect on the state of your union, you now cry out to him for help. Mercy and grace. He'll help you right now in your time of need. Yes, he will. Maybe you need to join this church. You come. Maybe you need prayer. I'd love to pray over you. On this first Sunday, I'd love to pray over you. Big God's blessing and favor on your life. You come. Everybody standing on your feet everywhere. As we open the altar, give you an opportunity to respond. You do it today.